Continuing this system security topic, let's now look at detection and prevention. Focusing first on networks, data can be intercepted and stolen across networks by packet sniffing software. And what this does is it captures the data between the two communicating devices. This is like the modern form of wiretapping. So you have some software on your computer that basically captures all the packets being transmitted across the network. And this is very easy to do over Wi-Fi, for example. And you actually can get software that does this for you. There's not much you can do about this. You can't really stop it from being intercepted. You can prevent it from being stolen because if you encrypt the data it can be less easily understood and so it's less easy to steal to do anything with and encryption is the process of making data secret so only the authorized viewers can decrypt and read the data and these third parties that aren't authorized can't read the data so it's scrambling up data you get plain text this is the word for your your original message you scramble it in some way to create ciphertext and then when it's received at your other end uh, it's decrypted back into the plain text. And the reason why you can decrypt it is because the receiver knows how it was encrypted initially. There's an algorithm that changes the plain text into ciphertext and the person who receives it knows the way to reverse it, they know the other way around so they can decrypt it into plain text. Now for something only exam boards seem to find interesting, this is network policies which are organisational rules for network access and poor policies uh, might might lead to you being more prone to security issues and I'm going to talk you through a few of these, again not hugely exciting I'm afraid but exam boards seem to love them. So first of all we've got the acceptable use policy which is what you agree to when you go to a network for the first time probably the first time you use a school network you get to do this when you go to hotels when you connect to their Wi-Fi you usually have to just say you agree to the terms and conditions that's what this is an acceptable use policy just some rules saying what's acceptable or not acceptable and it releases them of liability I suppose but also tells you or maybe gives you advice if you actually bother to read it about what not to do. The second policy is disaster recovery which is enacted when something goes wrong so there's some set procedure for when something goes wrong uh, like an attack so for example in the NHS cyber attack which happened recently when I'm recording this video they the policy was to shut down the computers that weren't affected so they didn't get affected by it, which is common sense but it needs to have this kind of procedure and often this results in the fact that a backup is restored that's a separate policy literally just saying that you've got a backup of all the data um, so that's another one you talk about but the disaster recovery is quite important I suppose because it gives you it, it gives clear steps to what to do if an attack happens Another policy which is often talked about is failover and this is all about having a backup of key hardware. So the backup policy is for backup, backing up data, this is for backing up actual hardware. So if a piece of your key hardware like a server router goes down, this policy will ensure there's a secondary backup device to take its place um, to prevent any downtime. And from a security point of view, say you had a device that works as a physical firewall to filter packets, if that, go if that device goes down, this policy might mean you've got a backup firewall just in case maybe a software version or another device to do this functionality and if the firewall goes down for too much time you're prone to I mean you're immediately vulnerable so this prevents any attacks perhaps but this is a general policy just when something goes wrong with your hardware. Another network policy which is less to do with security I suppose but it's still taught sometimes and this is about archiving and this is keeping a store of data that's not currently being used so previous information like employee information from before and you might even use this as an example of a poor network policy you might say that actually if this is sensitive information this is not a good thing to keep or if it is you've got to encrypt it and so on so this might be an example of um, a vulnerability but the rest are usually um, good policies to have. Penetration testing is a very important process when you're determining system security. This is simulating attack in order to find weaknesses. So in the testing process you attack your own system to find any weaknesses that exist. And so kind of this whole simulation of an attack is you trying to gain access to resources without actually knowing the normal means of access. So if you have your own username and password and you're trying to bypass it, you obviously won't use your username and password. The whole point is to try and pretend like you're coming from an external source. And there are two types of pen tests. A white box pen test is to simulate an inside attack where the attacker may have some knowledge of a system and may have basic credentials. So you might have like a, a basic username and password and then you have an administrator one or there's some database which you're not meant to access, normal employees won't be able to access. But you have some knowledge of how it works and so you're pretending uh, you, you're an employee of um, the company. Although penetrating testing is usually done by an external kind of company that does it for you. Um, we also have a black box pen test which you can guess is simulating an outside attack so some hacking so you have no real knowledge of a system and you have no credentials to use 
as I say, this is usually done by an external company and this whole service will involve at the end of review them telling you what they found and then if there are any vulnerabilities then countermeasures will be implemented to try and fix uh, these vulnerabilities. Network forensics is all about detection of attacks and this is the capture, recording and analysis of traffic, network traffic to discover attacks. And this is done perhaps using sniffing software as we talked about and lots of storage in that case and or by using web server logs which actually give you information about like when data was accessed. There are two kind of schools of thought for collecting packets, the first of which is catch as you can and this is when all packets are stored and then analysed later and the second is stop, look and listen where you very quickly analyse the packets pretty much as they're coming through and then you only store any information that's kind of stands out and a mini evaluation obviously this will need a lot of storage you've got to store all the packets and then you can analyse them in your own time later and this might not necessarily this will discover attack but maybe won't prevent it stop, look and listen requires less storage but a very very fast processor and this might actually manage to stop an active attack if you you know nib it in the bud very quickly but um, the processor is kind of the issue here. Let's end by looking at some security measures suggested by the exam board. A bit obvious but that's fine. We'll look at it quickly. First of all we have email confirmations that just confirm your identity i.e. that you have access to the email account you say you do. This may be more important if you've got a work email or a, a school email it kind of it, you, it, you are only a student would have the email address you do for your school. Uh, also, just passwords, having memory information, and fingerprints. Using these kind of measures to log in, for example, for banking, and the more you have, the less chance of a brute force attack working. Another one examiners love is talking about automatic software updates. It's very important to keep your software updated, especially for anti malware software, because general updates will include any patches, any fixes for any known vulnerabilities, and the anti malware software will update its database with you know, the current malware that's being circulated. Another common one mentioned is user access levels. This is where different permissions are applied to different people. So some people will be basic users, they have no access perhaps to the database or certain things, whereas administrators maybe have full access and this limits what people can do. And we mentioned that people have a weak points in systems, so this maybe limits for more irresponsible people from having access to even more secure data.